pillars. A pillar is a structure capable of supporting a building or a bridge. <clears throat> you can also think of the word as meaning as a person being a pillar of the community, meaning that he or she normally carries more than their own weight as far as making the community a better place to live. There are pillars in the Bible, and like most everything else, there are good pillars and there are bad pillars. The Lord instructed Israel to construct pillars to commemorate or memorialize important or major events. On the other hand, there were people, though, that built pillars to fake gods, to idols. The children of Israel were instructed uh, to destroy uh, those idols so that they wouldn't uh, become false religions or participants in false religions. Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 3 will document that. In Genesis chapter 28, the Lord confirmed the covenant that he made with Abraham, with Abraham's grandson, Jacob. Jacob then memorialized the place and the event with a pillar. That pillar became known most often as Jacob's pillar, although it has many different names, the stone of scone, the stone of destiny, for example. Open your Bibles to Genesis 28 as we ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Genesis 28, 1, and it reads, And Isaac called Jacob, and blessed him, and charged him, and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Don't pollute the seed line through which Messiah was to come. Genesis chapter 21, verse 12. In Isaac, this stated to Abraham, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Meaning that is the seed line through which Messiah would come. Arise and go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, Rebekah's father. And take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. Laban then, of course, being uh, uh, Jacob's uncle. And God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. The promise made to Abraham is the stars of heaven, or the sands of the sea shall thy people be and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger which God gave unto Abraham and note the star following that verse most of your Bibles that star indicates that that verse 99.9 percent .9 of the scholars believe that has to do with Messiah and indeed it would be the seed line through which Messiah would come. And Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Padan Aram unto Laban, son of Bethuel, the Syrian, and by resident only, geographical only, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's mother. Switch gears, we switch to Esau. When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Badan Aram uh, to take him a wife from thence, and that as he blessed him, he gave him charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Maybe that's the reason that Isaac blessed Jacob and not me. And that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Padan Aram. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of, the Canaan, of Canaan pleased not Isaac, his father. In the Hebrew, this is, they were evil in his eyes. Then went Esau unto Ishmael, 
Ishmael, you remember, being the son of Abraham and Hagar, who was of the heathen nations, Gentiles, and took him to the wives which he had, Mahaloth, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nabajoth, to be his wife. Still got the wrong seed line. He's thinking, well, if I take of that seed, uh, Jacob, or Isaac, I should say, would bless me like he blessed my brother, Jacob. But remember, it's in Isaac that thy seed will be called, Genesis 21, 12. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. Beersheba meaning uh, well of seven. To seven oneself was to take an oath. It's also called the well of the oath. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set, getting late in the day. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. I got up from my cozy bed this morning about 4.30 and went into the coffee pot and made my coffee and I read this refreshing my memory from last week and I thought man Jacob is a whole lot tougher than I was. I mean the dude took rocks and made a pillow and went to sleep. One of those stones is the stone of scone. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. If we backed up to Genesis chapter 11, we would find there where man tried to make a stairway to heaven. It's called the Tower of Babylon, which means confusion if you translate it. There's only one ladder to heaven. That ladder, and I hope you know, I know you know, is Jesus Christ. And behold, the Lord stood above it, the ladder, in heaven, in other words, and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, actually grandfather. There's not a word in the Hebrew for grandfather, or you could translate it ancestor. And the God of Isaac, that was his father, the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. That's the covenant. That's the promise that God made to Abraham. And here he's renewing, reestablishing that covenant with Abraham's grandson, Jacob. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Again, you see a star in most of your Bibles referring to Messiah. That's why all people would be blessed from the seed of Abraham. Messiah came through that seed. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this place for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Man breaks covenants, God does not. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. What an awesome experience for God to speak to someone. And God often spoke to people in their sleep. Uh, Solomon comes to mind. And he was afraid and said, how dreadful or how awesome is this place? Exclamation point. This is none other but the house of God, Bethel in the Hebrew language. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it, the oil sanctifying it or setting it apart. 
Now this word pillar in the Hebrew is matzabah. It's something uh, stationed. That is to say, a column or a memorial. In a bad sense, a negative sense, it could be translated an idol. And he called the name of that place Bethel, the house of God. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. It was built and named by a foreign nation. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. Verse 22, And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. We recently saw King Charles III, anointed, coronated, King of Great Britain. And could it be possible that Jeremiah took the three daughters of Zedekiah and this stone that Jacob used for a pillow to the British Isles? You know, a lot of people have said, isn't it remarkable how close the British coronation, the throne, is to the anointings of the kings of Israel and Judah? It's not a coincidence. Is it possible that this happened? That Jeremiah took the stone and Zedekiah's three daughters? I think it's more probable than possible. If that subject piques your interest, Pastor Arnold Murray did a message called Stone of Scone, uh, CD number 30924. We also offer a book in our library entitled Jacob's Pillar, and a DVD by E. Raymond Capp uh, by the title, A Documentary Stone of Destiny. There's another Hebrew word for pillar found in the Bible. Let's go to Genesis 19 as we continue our study on pillars. God sent two angels to Sodom and Gomorrah to see what condition they were in. It's it's not good. And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Lot was a righteous man. And he said, Behold now, my lords, this is to the angels, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, in other words, my house, and tarry all night and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. Lot knew what would happen if they abode in the street all night. Let me ask you about your city. Is it safe to abide in the street at night? Unfortunately, many can't answer that in the affirmative. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him and entered unto his house. And he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. Lot concerned for their safety, and he turns on the hospitality But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, Revelation 11, 8, the two witnesses when they're killed will lie in the street and spiritually will be called Sodom and Egypt. Compass the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter, even children were corrupt with the perversion. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came unto thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Moffat translates this a little more bluntly. That we may rape them is what Moffat 
translates this know them. You know, it's not much different today. I, can you imagine, and some of you are too young to even relate to this, but if you're 40 years or older, you can relate to how much things have changed in the last 30 years. Used to, if we wanted to know the sex or gender of a puppy, we raised it up and looked between its legs. And we knew whether it was male or female. How many of you would believe 30 years ago if someone had told you that if a man wanted to go into a female's restroom and use it and be protected by the federal government, would you believe that could happen? No. 30 years ago, the month of June was not designated as Gay Pride Month. A whole entire month of this. You've got workers in workplaces that go on strike or protest that their employers won't allow them to display rainbow flags in their workplaces. How things have changed in the last 30 years. We've become a lot like Sodom and Gomorrah. This was written for our admonition, folks, for our warning. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him to protect the two angels. And said, I pray ye, brethren, do not so wickedly, this to the people of Sodom, the Sodomites, Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. They're virgins, in other words. Let me, I pray ye, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. Lot uh, offering his own two daughters. Of course, he knew that these Sodomites weren't interested in females. They wanted males, men, perversion. And they, the Sodomites, said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow, referring to Lot, came in to sojourn. He, in other words, he's a foreigner, and he came here. And he will needs be a judge now will we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. Who do you think you are, Lot, is what the Sodomites are saying. You moved here from a foreign land. What are you going to do, make yourself our judge? There is one that's going to be their judge. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot, this, the two angels, into the house to them and shut to the door. A miracle is about to be performed. And they, the angels, smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great. This means both young and old. So that they wearied themselves to find the door. They were stumbling around, couldn't find the door to go in to get the angels. And the men, the angels, said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters? And whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. This is a warning. It's time to get out of Sodom. God's judgment is about to be passed. For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxen, it's become great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters. This was the sons that were going to marry his daughters. You remember back in the previous verse, verse 8, they were virgins. They weren't married yet. Up, get you out of this place. For the Lord will destroy this city, but he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. They thought that he wasn't serious. 
Uh, they per perhaps thought Lot had lost his mind. These future sons-in-law did not go with Lot, his wife, and his daughters. That is the reason that Ammon and Moab were both brought into the world by Lot's daughters. They didn't have husbands to carry on his seed, so his daughters carried on his seed. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot. Hurry up, hurry up, we got to get out of here. Saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon his hand, the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. Verse 17, And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee. That's a command. Neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape into the mountain lest thou be consumed. Don't stop in the valley. Get all the way to the mountains. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Now this is interesting. This word Lord is Adonai. Uh, curious, actually, that this word is used here. Perhaps uh, Lot saw the, uh, the Lord in the angels' manifestation. Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil take me and I die. Lot's saying, I don't think I can make it to the mountains. A little bit of a sissy. Behold now, this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. Let's make a deal. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing. Also that I will not overthrow this city. I'll not destroy Zoar is what they're talking about. For that which has spoken, which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither to Zoar. For I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore the name of the city <clears throat> was called Zoar. Zoar, if you translate it, means a little one. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar, those he cared about with him. This would be the last time the people of Sodom would see the sun rise in the flesh. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Judgment from the Lord caused this area to become the Dead Sea. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground pretty much wiped it out. Zoar lies at the south end of the Dead Sea. And you know, to this day, a vaporous sulfur rises from the earth. Huge blocks of saltpeter prevent anything from growing. No trace of animal or vegetable life witness the devastation brought upon this place. In the New Testament, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 states Sodom and Gomorrah were turned to ashes, making them an ensample to those who would live ungodly. An example to those who would live ungodly. Will the ungodly pay attention? I don't think so. I think they're happy in their way. But another example happened here. Let's go ahead with the next verse. But his wife, this is Lot's wife, looked back from behind him and she became a pillar 
of salt. This word pillar is netzib in the Hebrew. It means something stationary, such as a statue. This happened, too, as an example to those who would live ungodly. The Lord instructed Joshua to build a pillar where Israel crossed over Jordan into the promised land. Turn with me to Joshua chapter 4, verse 1, as we continue our study. Let's back up actually to chapter 3 of Joshua, verse 14. And it came to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan and the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. This is as they're, they've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Uh, everyone has died except Caleb and Joshua, the only two that God allowed to enter the promised land from that generation that he judged to die in the wilderness. And as they that bear the ark were coming to Jordan, this is the river, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of the harvest. In other words, it's flood season. The water is not just running down Jordan, it is rushing down Jordan is the point that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon an heap very far from the city Adam uh, that is beside Zaratan and those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea failed and were cut off and the people passed over right against Jericho from the east side of Jordan over the Jordan direct shot into Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan, from a rushing flood to dry ground. Remember the Red Sea? Might come to mind. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan entering the promised land, much as many of you will enter the promised land, I think, in the not-so-distant future. It's called the millennium, the kingdom of God. Continuing on into chapter 4, And it came to pass, when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take ye twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe, uh, a man, one for every tribe, and command ye them, saying, Take ye hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night, going to build a memorial, a pillar. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of the tribe, uh, every tribe, a man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take ye up every man of, of you a stone upon his shoulder. Don't get just a little rock. Get a large stone, so large that you would have to carry it on your shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. Verse 6, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Father, what, what does this pillar of stones mean? Then ye shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. Don't forget what the Lord has done for you. 
King Solomon's temple had two important pillars. In fact, they're so important that they had names. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 13. <clears throat> King David wanted to build the temple, but he was a man of blood, and God wrote the pattern of the temple on David, and then he shared that with his son Solomon, but it would be Solomon who would build the house of God. 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 13. And King Solomon sent and fetched Hiram out of Tyre. He's called Huram in 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 13, the same man. He was a widow's son, one of nine specifically mentioned in the Bible, of the tribe of Naphtali, and his father was a man of Tyre, a worker in brass, and he was filled with wisdom and understanding and cunning to work all works in brass. And he came to King Solomon and wrought all his work. He probably brought a lot of assistance with him. This, uh, of the tribe of Naphtali, actually, he was of the, the, his mother was of the tribe of Dan, as it's written in 2 Chronicles 2, verse 14. Uh, but this uh, of Naphtali uh, would be because uh, of a death. Verse 15, for he cast two pillars of brass of 18 cubits high apiece, and a line of 12 cubits did compass either of them about a cubit uh, subject to whose definition. Let's just use two feet for uh, easy calculating. Uh, 18 cubits times two would be 36 feet tall. Uh, the circumference is what the uh, compass, either of them round about, is 12 cubits would be 24 feet in circumference. And he made two catheters. These would be uh, crowns or capitals of molten brass to set upon the tops of the pillars. The height of the one catheter was five cubits. Biblical numerics, you know five is grace. And the height of the other catheter was five cubits. So we have a total of 23 cubits, uh, basically or approximately 46 feet tall. And nets or lattice work of checker work and wreaths of chain work. This would be twisted chains to make a rope. For the catheters which were upon the top of the pillars seven for the one catheter and seven for the other. Biblical numerics number seven, spiritual perfection. And he made the pillars and two rows round about them of one network to cover the catheters that were upon the top with pomegranates. Pomegranates have a multitude of seeds, uh, symbolic of life. And so did he for the other catheter. And the catheters that were upon the top of the pillars were of lily work, who is the lily of the valley, Jesus Christ, Song of Solomon 2, verses 1 and 2. In the porch, four cubits. Christ is the head of the crown. And the catheters upon the two pillars had pomegranates also above. Over against the belly was by the network, and the pomegranates were 200 in rows round about upon the other catheter. 200 uh, pomegranates on each pillar. And he set up the pillars in the porch of the temple. And he set up the right pillar and called the name thereof Joachim. Joachim means he shall establish. And he set up the left pillar and called the name thereof Boaz. In him is strength translated. Now these two pillars were temporary. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 52. Uh, 
there are some pillars that are going to be permanent, but Joaquin and Boaz are temporary. Jeremiah 52, 17. We're all the way to the taking of Jerusalem into captivity. I'm not going to cover a great deal there. Verse 17. Also the pillars of brass that were in the house of the Lord and the bases and the brazen sea that was in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans, that's the same as the Babylonians, break and carried all the brass of them to Babylon. You all know where I'm going in conclusion. Revelation chapter 3. The permanent pillars in the temple. Revelation chapter 3. Let's pick it up with verse 1. And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, there were seven churches in all. These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. This means spiritually dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Some of you are playing church. Some of you aren't watching, which is what the church is to be doing, watching and mourning. They didn't make the cut. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If, therefore, thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. In other words, you will be deceived by the Antichrist. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, not worshipped the Antichrist. And they shall walk with me, Christ speaking, in white, for they are worthy. Those in white, the, what makes up that linen? It's your righteous acts. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Revelation 13, 8, everyone is going to be deceived and worship the Antichrist except those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Make sure your name is in the Lamb's book of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Verse 7, And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, Now you want to be in a church that teaches what the church of Philadelphia and the church of Smyrna teach. What is that? Well, listen up. These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Isaiah 22, 22 speaks of this key of David. That key that opens this book, the Word of God, it opens it, that no man can shut it. No man can take that away from you. Don't let those who try with false teaching, with false prophets, take your crown. Out of the root of Jesse would come Jesus Christ. That's what the church of Philadelphia and the church of Smyrna taught. They taught who the Kenites were. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. 
and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. You didn't bow a knee to the Antichrist. You rejected the Antichrist. You kept the word of God in your focus. Behold, I will make them the, of the synagogue of Satan. My words? No, the words of Jesus Christ. The synagogue of Satan, the Kenites, which say they are Jews. They claim to be of our brother Judah and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Every knee will bow. We will be at the feet of Jesus Christ, so they will come and bow because we're at the feet of Christ. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. That hour mentioned in Mark chapter 14, verse 35. Which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Are you going to be tempted in the hour of temptation? No, you're not going to be tempted. You know who the Antichrist is, and to you he is an abomination. Behold, I come quickly. I say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh, that's you, beloved, you who will be singing the song of Moses, Revelation 15, 3, and the song of the Lamb. I make uh, him that overcometh, will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the new city of my God, which is new Jerusalem. Do you know what that name is? Ezekiel chapter 48, verse 35. In the Hebrew tongue, Yahweh Shammah. The Lord is there. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. I think that new name you can read about in Isaiah chapter 62, verse 14. Hepzibah, my delight is in her. Her land shall be called Beulah, which in the Hebrew tongue is married. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. A pillar... Uh, of the community, someone who carries more than their share of the load. That's what God's elect are. They, they are willing to do more than what others. That's the reason you're going to be a pillar, eternal pillar in the temple of God. Think about that. What an honor. Don't let anyone take your crown with false teaching. Hold on to that word, as Jesus said. Be steadfast. Don't be a reed blown in the, the wind one way and then by one doctrine and then another by a doctrine. The doctrine that's important to us is right here, right here in the word. Hold fast the word of God that no man take your crown. Be a pillar in the temple of God. Let's go to his throne. Yahweh Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word, Father, your word that tells us how to be pleasing to you, Father. We ask that everything we do the rest of this day be the honor and glory of your name. Father, bless this congregation. We're always careful to give you the praise. In Jesus' precious name, amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? 
Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Uh, Reuben was the sign of man. <clears throat> Ephraim was the ox or calf, and Dan the eagle. I think, <clears throat> excuse me, it's going to be very interesting to see uh, what it is the setup in the millennium, or even better yet, in the eternity, uh, something to do with those uh, four camps of the tribes of Israel is got something to do with the Zune and the Zoi. I'm sure of it. I'm, uh, it's going to be interesting to find out what that is in the future. John in Kentucky, please explain Leviticus chapter 22 verse 5. And it states there, Whosoever uh, toucheth any creeping thing is unclean, or a man of whom he may take uncleanness whatsoever uncleanness he hath. Uh, creeping things are basically bugs, if you will. The latter part of the verse is talking about coming in contact with a man who is unclean uh, for the reasons listed in Leviticus chapter 15, verses 7 through 19, having to do with a, a running issue. Daniel in Texas, my question the children of God and the angels, are they one of the same or are they different? I believe that we were with God before we came to earth, but I have a hard time trying to explain this. Can you give me scripture that would help? Yes, I believe I can. Uh, Job chapter 1 verse 6. And what was going on there, Satan well, first of all, God and the sons of God, meaning the angels, were together. And Satan came up and God said, hey, Satan, where have you been? And he said, I've been walking to and fro on the earth. But they're called the sons of God or the angels, just as in Genesis chapter 6, verse 2, uh, those are called the sons of God. They are the fallen angels there in Genesis chapter 6. C.G. in Texas. Someone said to me that if I don't go to a certain denomination church that I won't go to heaven. Well, that person told you wrong. And I can assure you that John 3.16 doesn't mention any denominations as those who have eternal or everlasting life. You know, there would... There are no denominations, again, mentioned in John 3, 16. Uh, guess what? There won't be any denominations in the eternity either. I'm sure that breaks a lot of people's heart because they're planning on being in that section of the heaven that is for this denomination and or that denomination is down the road and all of them think they're the only ones up there. Uh, they're deceiving themselves. That's not the way it's going to be. Denomination means division. And denominations of Christianity are divided because they have different thoughts on different subjects, different beliefs. There's only going to be one uh, line of thought and belief in heaven, and that's God's, not the traditions of men. Roy and Tennessee or Indiana, where in the Bible does it say Satan will come here before Jesus does? Well, many places. Uh, one of my favorites is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. 
makes it very clear what events have to happen before Jesus returns. And it makes it very clear there that Satan shows up uh, claiming to be uh, God or Jesus himself. Matthew 24 and Mark 13 also tell us the events that must come to pass before Jesus returns. And you've got Antichrist here before Jesus returns at the second advent. Carol from Michigan, please tell me the three generations, I think she means the length of generations, and where to find them in the Word. Well, you have a 40-year generation, a 70-year generation, and a 120-year generation found in God's Word. The 40-year generation comes from the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 14, where God judged the nation of Israel to wander in the wilderness, the desert, for 40 years until that generation died and then their children would move in and possess the promised land. A uh, 70-year generation you'll find in Psalm 90, uh, verse 10, three score in 10 years, a score is 20, three tw times 20 is 60, plus 10 is 70. A uh, 120-year generation you find in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. Hope that helps. Michael from Pennsylvania, 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Is the letter, the Ten Commandments, if it killeth, should the ten be followed? Yes and yes. The, the letter is the law. And we should do the best uh, we can uh, to follow God's commandments. Uh, what this verse means is that if we, um, if it, uh, up to us living by the law, none of us would have salvation. In other words, the law was good, but man is bad. And without Jesus Christ, none of us would find salvation if we were being judged by the law. <clears throat> Ellen in Missouri. Um, first, God bless you and family. Thank you and, and God bless you as well. I have put this one on the shelf many times and have taken it off many times. The four virgin daughters of Philip. What are their names and where can I find them? Well, uh, they are not named. Uh, they're mentioned in Acts chapter 21, verses 8 and 9. It just simply states there that Philip had four virgin daughters and all of them did prophesy. That means to teach. David in Georgia, dear Pastor Dennis, I am writing to ask when I study on my own afterwards, 10 minutes or so later, I can't remember what I read. I have to underline or highlight scripture to help me. <clears throat> My question is, will I fall to the Antichrist if I can't remember scripture? I would feel sad knowing I failed my father. I love him and I do not want to fail him. Thank you, Pastor Dennis. Much love to you and your staff. Well, much love right back at you, uh, uh, David. Memorizing scripture is not important to understanding scripture. David, I'm sure that you understand that the Antichrist comes first. And you understand that to worship him is to uh, is the unforgivable sin if you're one of God's election. And you're not going to fail your father. You're going to be a soldier for your heavenly father. <clears throat> John in Tennessee. I take issue with a lot of your teaching. I think you are misleading a lot of people. However, I want I want to get in, I won't get into all that. Just one thing. I heard your announcer say to the word Exodus that it means was in the name of it's common knowledge that Exodus means a departure or coming out. What say you to this? Well, I don't know for what you heard that Exodus, oh, well, the title of Exodus 
is, what is the beginning? Go to verse 1 of Exodus chapter 1. And it states there, these are the names. That's the name of the book. Just as uh, Genesis, uh, the, the whole book of Genesis, the, you go to the first verse, in the beginning. That's what Genesis means. Leviticus uh, by Yikara in the Hebrew tongue means the Lord called. If you go to verse 1 of Leviticus chapter 1, the Lord called. Numbers is in the wilderness. Deuteronomy, these are the words. You got to go back to the Hebrew to know what I'm talking about on that, but that's where the names of the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible came from was what the verse, first verse starts out. Kathy in Michigan, please explain 2 Peter chapter 3 and how this relates to the three world ages. Well, verse 3 states, In the last day shall be scoffers. Look around you today. There are a lot of scoffers. They scoff Christians. They scoff God. They scoff Jesus Christ. Verse 4, they say, saying, where Christ, where is Christ? I don't think he is coming. And then verses 5 and 6, willingly ignorant that by the word of God the heavens were of old. That's the first earth and heaven age. The world that then was was overflowed with water. That's not talking about Noah's flood. That's talking about the flood of Jeremiah chapter 4. I'm out of time. I love you all a great deal. Why? Because you do and study, enjoy studying God's Word in depth. And, and you'd love to have Him touch you with knowledge and understanding. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important, though, and it's this. You stay in His Word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.